thank you for that nice introduction and for inviting me to speak with your nice group. Um, today, I'd like to uh, tell you a story of redemption, um, and I call that Pluto Strikes Back. I will start in, at the beginning when Pluto was discovered. Um, in the late, uh, in the middle 1800s, uh, Neptune was discovered um, actually by the scientific method where um, Uranus had been discovered in the early 1800s and its motion did not follow Newton's laws. And so um, people looked at the motions of Uranus and figured out where Neptune or another planet needed to be if Newton's laws were indeed correct and they discovered Neptune. Um, as the century went on, uh, the motions of Uranus and Neptune still didn't quite follow Neptune's laws. And so Percival Lowell in uh, 1915 predicted that there would be yet another planet beyond Neptune. And he predicted where it would be. And um, unlike the discovery of Neptune, where it took maybe a year or two from the prediction to the discovery, uh, it took 15 years for uh, Lowell's prediction to become true. And you can sort of see that from this uh, particular schematic, which is a schematic of the solar system. It's the orbits of all of the planets and the asteroid belt uh, with the sun uh, at the center. And then as you go out, various ellipses for the orbits of the planets and here's Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And now here we have Pluto. Pluto is inclined very highly, about 19 or 20 degrees, uh, relative to the plane that pretty much all the other uh, planets orbit in. It also was too faint, or too, too faint, um, because it was about a factor of 100 fainter than Neptune. And people thought that uh, it should only be about a factor of three or four fainter than Neptune. Um, so it, it was too small, because it was too faint, uh, and it had this weird orbit. And so people were very uh, <laughs> surprised that the, the planet that they discovered did not meet the predictions of uh, Lowell. And as the uh, 20th century went on, um, Pluto continued to be you know, observed. Um, and then in uh, the 1970s, uh, Christie at, again, Lowell Observatory, discovered using uh, images of Pluto uh, on their telescopes, saw that on some nights Pluto had a bulge on one side, uh, a little extra you know, thing to it on one side. And then a few days later, there, this bulge was on the other side. And after observing over and over and over again, he realized that Pluto had a companion, uh, which was named Charon or some people in NASA call it Charon, but I will call it Charon. Um, and the amazing thing about the orbit of Pluto and Charon is that every so often, the orbital plane of this binary planet um, is in the line of sight towards the Earth. So Pluto eclipses Charon and Charon eclipses Pluto, like lunar eclipses or solar eclipses. And because Pluto and Charon have disks, it's possible to record the brightness of the combined uh, system as a function of time and derive the brightness uh, and dimness of various features on Pluto. And that was done with Hubble Space Telescope. This is the image created from Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble Space Telescopes cannot see it like this, as I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, but you can see that there are dark regions. Pluto is on the left, Charon is on the right, the smaller one. And you can see there are bright regions and dark regions. And this is a, the highest resolution image that you can get from HST. And it's from observing these mutual eclipses over and over and over again. And it sort of stayed that way. That was about the best we could learn from Pluto. It, we learned that it had a little bit of an atmosphere. Um, we didn't learn anything about whether Charon had an atmosphere. And, and as the, in the 1990s started, um, Pluto started to, to lose the faith of the astronomical community. That's because in 1992, Jane Liu, uh, with the help of a colleague named Dave Jewett, 
discovered the first object in what's called the Kuiper belt. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. But you can see uh, with this arrow here, there's a little dot. And in successive images of that field, you can see that it moves. And with that motion, we can figure out how far away it is. We know how fast it moves across the sky. Um, and we know how um, Newton's laws work in the solar system. And so we can see that this object has an orbit very similar to Pluto. And the difference is that it has an almost circular orbit and is in the plane of the solar system. And as the 1990s went on, Jane and Dave discovered a bunch of these uh, and they discovered some fairly big ones, uh, which are shown here. We have Eris, which has a little uh, companion called Dysnomia. And Eris is slightly bigger than Pluto, or at least it was at that time. Um, and then there's Makemake, Haumea, which also has a few uh, moons around it, Sedna, Orcus, Quaor, and Varuna. This is not the full set, but it gives you an idea that uh, there are a bunch of objects in the, you know, in the outer part of the solar system beyond the orbit of Neptune. Um, these are all artists' uh, conceptions uh, at the time of, shortly after the time of discovery, uh, more or less based on how bright they are and um, how much light they reflect, uh, because all of these objects can be observed uh, with the Spitzer Space Telescope uh, to detect their thermal infrared radiation uh, and in optical uh, and near infrared telescopes to detect their optical and near infrared radi radiation. And so you can get their full, um, the full amount of light that they reflect and radiate. And based on that, you can figure out how much light they actually do reflect. Uh, and Pluto reflects about 20% of the light that hits it. Uh, and something like Sedna and Orcus reflect about five or six percent. Um, and so here's a schematic of, of all the orbits of these so-called Kuiper belt objects. Um, we have, this is looking down on top of the solar system. Um, the little circles or ellipses are the orbits of planets orbiting the sun. The sun is at the center. The white circle or ellipse is Jupiter. The red ellipse is Saturn. The green ellipse is Uranus. The blue ellipse is Neptune. This cyan ellipse is Pluto. You can see that Pluto goes inside the orbit of Neptune every so often. Um, then uh, these other cyan dots are the positions of other known objects in this so-called Kuiper belt, which is a band similar to the asteroid belt. Uh, we have the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, lots of rocks that are ranged in size from a thousand kilometer diameters or radii down to you know, tens. Um, and the same is true in the Kuiper belt. Pluto has a radius of a little over a thousand kilometers and the smallest object in this belt has a radius of around, that we've detected has a radius of around 10 or 20 kilometers. And occasionally they detect an object that has a very elliptical orbit, this magenta ellipse. Um, and that results because some of these objects every so often get too close to Neptune. Uh, the Neptune gravity of Neptune perturbs the orbit. And so they were all sort of like Neptune, you know, Pluto's orbit and they get kicked out of the solar system. And this ellipse gets, <clears throat> gets more and more elliptical with time because every time it comes back close to Neptune, ne Neptune gives it a little gravitational shove. And so its distance out here at the outer part of its orbit gets farther and farther away from the sun until it leaves the solar system completely. So because there were lots of these, um, you know, there were about you know, a half a dozen to a dozen other Kuiper belt objects as big as Pluto. So astronomers had a choice. They could say there are 20 planets or they could demote Pluto and call it a dwarf planet. Um, and there are dwarf planets in the asteroid belt. So that wasn't um, a, a, a tremendous leap. Um, and there are dwarf stars. The sun is a dwarf star, uh, for example. So in the end, they decided uh, rather than count to 20, they decided to count to eight um, and, uh, and demote Pluto. And here's a side view of all the orbits in the solar system uh, where, where all the magenta orbit 
little bunch of lines in the, in the sort of the middle of the figure are the orbits of the giant planets and the cyan ellipse is the orbit of Pluto. And then there are all these other Kuiper belt objects. There are a bunch of objects, as you can see, <clears throat> well out of the plane of the solar system. There are these up here and these over here. Um, those have orbits like Pluto. And there are others that uh, are in the plane of the solar system and have more circular orbits. And so since there were so many of these, Pluto was demoted. And so here we have a little image of the, you know, the eight other planets, um, you know, demoting and chastising Pluto and uh, removing it from the realm of planets. That caused a big stir, as you probably all heard or read about. Um, you know, lots of people were upset. Um, I want Pluto to be a planet again. This was the sign on a movie theater. Um, and then there were protests, uh, big organized protests wanting Pluto to be a planet. Pluto is still a dwarf planet. And the rest of this talk is not really about whether Pluto is a planet or not, but why Pluto is an interesting astrophysical object, whether you call it a planet or a dwarf planet or a string beam. Um, it doesn't really matter what the, what the name is. Um, a rose is a rose is a rose. So the redemption of Pluto started with the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. This is an image of ASET from HST, two images. Um, so the HST has a, a bunch of, of instruments. And I, I'll call the Hubble Space Telescope HST, just to, to not have to say that over and over and over again. Um, so here's an image taken on February 2006. Uh, Pluto is the brightest object in the upper left uh, of the left panel, and the Charon is the fainter object in the lower right. And then you can see way to the right in the diffraction spikes, uh, which are caused by the support of the mirrors. Um, there's a little, a little dot just below the diffraction spike and a somewhat brighter dot a little farther out. And they obtained a bunch of images um, and they found that these two little dots are not background stars. They are little satellites that orbit uh, Pluto and Charon. And they don't orbit Pluto or, the, or Charon separately. Um, it, to give you an idea of the geometry, um, which I will in a minute, uh, the center of mass of the Pluto-Charon system is outside of Pluto. So Charon and Pluto orbit a point outside of Pluto. And in the Earth-Moon system, the Moon and Earth orbit a point inside the Earth. Uh, so the Earth-Moon system is not considered a binary, uh, but the Pluto-Charon system is. So over the next few years, they discovered two more satellites. Uh, so here is another image with the orbits superimposed. So Pluto is in the center. Charon below to the left. And then there are four uh, satellites. Uh, Styx is the closest, and then Nix, and then Kerberos, and then Hydra. And uh, the naming is, is interesting. Um, Kerberos would nominally be Cerberus, given the, the names of Nix, Styx, and Hydra. But Cerberus is an asteroid, and so you couldn't repeat the name. Uh, and so they took the more Greek sounding or Greek actual name, uh, Kerberos. So the center of mass in this system, if, if you can see my little arrow here, uh, the cursor, uh, Pluto is here and the center of mass is just outside. And all of these objects orbit in the same plane. So the orbit of Pluto and Charon is, is essentially circular to the best that we can measure it. Uh, it's also tidally locked. Pluto and Charon have the same face pointed at each other um, all the time. The orbital period is, is, as I remember, around six days. And so the day on Pluto and Charon is also six days. The uh, Hydra orbits in about a month. The others are a little, little less than that. And their orbits are also nearly circular. So, you know, they, they all orbit in the same plane within a degree of the same plane, a degree or two of the same plane. And the orbits are, to the best of our measurement ability, you know, essentially circular with eccentricities of 0 0.01, 0 0.02 or less. 
So this makes Pluto a pretty cool thing in the solar system. It's the only binary planet in the solar system. And it has these funky little satellites, um, which we will learn more about as we go on. There's not much you can do with these satellites with HST other than image them. They're too faint to get a spectrum of and to learn what they're composed of. Um, and the early measurements, uh, it was thought that Kerberos and Styx reflect very little light. Um, that's why they're so dim and that Nix and Hydra um, reflect a lot of light from the sun and that's why they're bright. So then we had the New Horizons flyby. New Horizons was launched in the early 2000s. Um, this is a, a NASA picture of what the satellite uh, would look like if you could take a picture outside of it and it was orbiting the earth or something. Um, it went to Pluto and unlike some of the satellites that we've sent to uh, you know, other planets, New Horizons did not orbit Pluto and Charon. It flew past. Um, so it spent you know, a few hours there, maybe a day, depending on where you want to define the boundaries of the system, uh, and then it went off. And so um, it has a whole set of instruments that can image it, can take spectra, um, can do, uh, make, measure the dust in the area, can measure magnetic fields, can you know, see what the sun is doing. Um, and it had all to, to do all that in you know, a day or so during the close approach. And it revealed some amazing images. Uh, which are still being analyzed as they try to figure out what, what the heck is going on in Pluto. But this is an image of Pluto. Um, they pretty much only got to image one side of it um, because as I said, they couldn't orbit. So whatever side of Pluto was facing it was the side they got to image. Um, you can see there are craters uh, in the sort of the lower left quadrant. quadrant. There is something that looks like a sea. Um, there's you know, various bright and dark patches. And on the uh, really high resolution images, you can see flowing ice. Um, so we have the, the sort of the flat, flattish part is, is ice. The, uh, at the top of the picture, you see things that look like mountains. Uh, these are all composed of nitrogen, frozen nitrogen. Um, the planet you know, has a density of around two grams per cubic centimeter. So it has a lot of ice. Um, rock would have, you know, the earth is, has a density of six, give or take. Um, so it's, it has a lot of ice-like features, ammonia ice, methane ice, but mostly nitrogen ice and water ice. And this is not nitrogen ice. This is the, the best image of Charon. Uh, you can see a, a very, uh, on the, sort of the right at, at two o'clock, give or take, um, you see, uh, you know, that it looks like it, somebody's pulling a plug out of it. Um, that's a very deep valley that's bigger than the Grand Canyon, um, deeper and longer. Um, there's a, you know, a dark spot at the, up to the top. There are other sort of rills and, and features on Charon. And then they got, uh, these are the best pictures they have of the little moons, um, Styx uh, and Kerberos are far away. Nix and Hydra were closer, so they got a little better images. And they were actually able to measure the, what we call the albedo or the reflectivity of all of these. Um, and the reflectivity ranges from about 55% to close to 80%. So they are pretty smooth structures, uh, pretty icy reflective structures for something created by nature. Um, I mean, human beings can create mirrors that reflect uh, you know, 95 to 99% of the light, um, but you know, it's, it's hard for nature to create something that is so reflective. And these are extremely reflective uh, and rather small. Nix and Hydra are about uh, 10 kilometer radius and Styx and Kerberos are around five. Um, and they, you know, they haven't really uh, placed them here in, in a way that indicates the scale really well. Um, Kerberos on a lot of images, um, it actually looks like two balls stuck together uh, or two you know, ball-like things stick together. Um, Hydra and Nix um, have aspect ratios of three to two to one. So these are not spheres. So that sort of gives you a little introduction to the Pluto count system. And now I'd like to tell you a little bit about what my colleague Ben Bromley and I do 
uh, to try to understand their system. And um, we're focused on trying to understand where the satellites come from and what their properties are. So the pieces of information, in addition to what I've told you so far, that we're interested in is that HST and New Horizons spent a lot of time looking for new satellites. Uh, and so they can place pretty good limits on the size of any satellite that might exist there. And so any other satellite in the system has to have a radius of less than two kilometers. And they know the sizes of the satellite, but they don't know their masses because they don't know the density. Um, because you'd measure the mass by something like Newton's laws or you know, have, if the satellite could orbit, you could figure out the mass that way, uh, but they don't have a good way of figuring out the mass. So we've been trying to figure out the masses, uh, figure out if there should be any new satellites and trying to understand how the system formed in the first place. So to start that story, uh, I'll begin with the early story of the history of the solar system. So the sun uh, formed, you know, 4.5 something or other billion years ago. And it presumably started like all the other stars that we see that are forming now. Um, and it, it starts with a ball of gas. Um, the ball of gas collapses. Um, because the ball has some rotation, it can't collapse spherically, symmetrically. If it had no rotation whatsoever, it could just collapse into a star and there would be no uh, planetary system around it. But because it has a little bit of rotation supplied by the galaxy, um, it collapses into a star at the center, which is here in the, this bright thing at the center of this image. Uh, and then there's the rest of it uh, collapses into a disk. So roughly a tenth of the mass that will end up in the sun uh, ends up in this disk. And the disk has a, you know, a size comparable to the size of the solar system. And it's composed of, you know, mostly hydrogen, helium, um, the other elements that we all know and love uh, in traces and lots of little dust grains, uh, micron sized dust grains. Within this disk, the micron sized dust grains agglomerate and grow into bigger things. The disk helps that along by concentrating you know, pebble-sized things into bigger, 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 and bigger things. Eventually, you make things we call planetesimals. Uh, the planet planetesimals accrete any leftover pebbles, and they become planets. And my colleague Ben and Bromley and I study how this process works. And you know, the model for the formation of Pluto and Charon is that there is a giant impact. And so the idea uh, for the formation of the satellites is that early on in this disk, somewhere in this disk, we had Pluto. Well, let's say Pluto is here and Charon is over here and their orbits intersected. And Charon you know, collided with Pluto and it wasn't a head-on collision. You know, it was a glancing collision. And because the collision was glancing, uh, Charon kicked off a little bit of Pluto's surface, lost some velocity and became bound. And there was some debris left over from that. And we are trying to understand if the debris from that collision can make the satellites. Uh, here is a schematic or a, you know, a sign, an artist's illustration of how that would work. We have Charon here in the upper right, Pluto in the lower left, Charon comes from sort of, a, it's a glancing co collision. So it, it hits tangentially with Pluto and it goes off. And it, this stuff that gets kicked up where they collide uh, is, is something that could make the satellite system. The other option is that that debris just goes off into the netherworld um, and you're left with a binary planet, uh, Pluto and Charon with nothing around it. And later uh, a smaller object, uh, uh, a Kuiper Belt object, or what's now called a trans-Neptunian object, or TNO, um, collides with Charon, that kicks up debris, and that makes the satellite system. So we have two options, this giant impact where two big planets collide, or where we have a little object colliding with Charon. So and the, the geometry is sort of the same uh, in the sense that to make this 
to make the little impact, the larger impact work, but not the giant impact, the trans-Neptunian object, Kuiper Belt object, has to come in from, you know, the lower right, hit Pluto in a glancing, hit Charon in a glancing collision, and go off, and then there's some debris left over. So our goal is to understand what happens to the debris. And this is just a little animation, um, and it's, it's really schematic in the sense that it, it, this isn't how the system looks. Um, but we have, you know, the idea is that we have Pluto in the center, Charon there, and we have a bunch of debris around it, which I've made circular just to, to make the animation simple. And then as time goes on, two things happen. Because Pluto and Charon have a fair bit of gravity, they push stuff away. And they try to eject a lot of it out of the system altogether. But as they do that, the, the leftover stuff can agglomerate. Excuse and me, why, would, why would gravity push it away? I thought it would pull it in. Well, gravi gravity, gravity, I'll go back to the start. Let's see if we can get back to the start. So, Early on, the debris is in, in orbits that are unstable. So they're so, you know, if you think of the sun, every orbit around the sun that doesn't go through the sun is stable because there are circular orbits around the sun and there's nothing, um, you know, the gravitational potential or the gravity that an object feels is pretty much the same all the time. I mean, orbits are elliptical, but that's a small, a small issue. With Pluto and Charon, uh, Charon is a tenth the mass of Pluto. There's a region around Pluto, and this ring is in it, around the system. This ring of stuff is, is more or less in it, um, where the orbits are unstable. They don't, can't last very long. So the, a, an object, say, that's orbiting here feels a, the gravity that it feels changes as it orbits around the system. Some of that can pull it, sometimes it pulls it in, but sometimes it pulls it in, but it doesn't hit either object and it gives it a high velocity. And that high velocity pushes it out or allows it to go out. And so the objects that are unstable either have to hit Pluto and Charon or they have to be ejected from the system. And so gravity is a funny thing in, in astronomy. Um, is that gravity does a lot of pushing. Um, and as I showed you earlier um, in the orbits, I can go back if this doesn't confuse people, the orbits of objects in the Kuiper belt, this magenta object is, um, the object that's on this magenta orbit is an object where Neptune's gravity gives it a little shove every time it gets close to Neptune, which is up in the right here. Um, but it, it does pull it in, but it doesn't hit Neptune. And since it doesn't hit Neptune, it's going faster. And that allows it to go farther away every orbit. But does that answer the question? Uh, kind of like when you throw a bolo. And you get it spinning around and then it is, you yeah. lengthen your arm out and the and the bolo exits your system. Yeah, I think I yes. understand it better now. Thank you. And, and if you're not very good at doing the bolo, it can hit your head. <laughs> <laughs> then it doesn't exit your so, system. It enters your system. The, yes. So these these orbits, and I'll show you, uh, you know, a schematic of what the real orbits look like. This is the set of real orbits after a collision. So we have Pluto here, and the ellipse that's magenta is Charon's orbit. And then the orange ellipses are the orbits of the debris. And this actually is the configuration for debris from a collision where something hit Charon and, it, and tried to you know, leave Charon. So these orbits have to come back to Charon. They don't have much choice, but Charon does move. So they don't come back to hit Charon. But anyway, these, these orbits that cross or come close to Charon's orbit are all unstable. So if there was no other physical process 
other than the gravity of Pluto and the gravity of Charon, all of this material would eventually either hit Pluto, hit Charon, or leave. It doesn't have any other choices. Scott, but this, is this is hypothetical as opposed to uh, measured data? This is a theory. Fair enough. Does, does this get more complicated because the central mass rotates uh, in its own or uh, around, uh, it doesn't, it's not in the, the central point. That, the it pulls the, back and forth, back and forth. Right, so Pluto had, traces a, the little orbit that's in white, so it doesn't move very much. Charon is going around the magenta orbit of the magenta ellipse. So they move. And this stuff that's all in the orange ellipses, and you have to, I, I've just shown a few of them. There's a whole continuum of ellipses and they have all possible angles. So that the, the space is sort of filled. But if I drew all the ellipses, it would be rather confusing or at least more confusing than it is. Um, so as I said, yeah, as Jerry said, Charon is going around this ellipse with a period of a few days. Pluto is going around its ellipse with the same period. And this stuff that's ejected has longer periods because it goes farther away, but all of it returns to Charon's orbit. So eventually it would hit Charon or its orbit would be perturbed such that it would get ejected from the system or it would hit Pluto or Charon. But there are, there's another physical process at work here. And that's because this debris is all a bunch of small particles. And that's, that's a, a numerical calculation that what happens when you hit two particles together. Um, and you can do this a sort of an experiment at home. You know, you can take a rock and hit it with a hammer. Um, and it, it has a bunch of pieces and the pieces are not all identical. They're not spherical. Um, there's like a distribution of sizes. And people do those kinds of experiments actually in laboratories where they take a, you know, a target of any shape and they have a little, you know, gun uh, that accelerates another object and they collide them together and they see what happens. Uh, and then they do numerical simulations um, using what we know about solid objects and they collide them together because it's hard on the earth to collide a 10 kilometer object with a three kilometer object. Um, so they do numerical experiments of what happens. And so these trajectories are based on those numerical experiments that if you have Charon and, and Pluto sitting there orbiting around each other, minding their own business, and another object comes in and hits Charon, um, we sort of know from all these experiments, uh, experiments and simulations, what happens to the debris from the collision. And it will have orbits sort of like this. And the extra piece of, of physics that these collisions have, or this system has, is that because all of the objects in this orbit, these orbits are tiny, you know, size of a meter say, or maybe a centimeter, they collide. And every time they collide, they lose energy. And they also might merge. But they, they lose some energy and that tends to circularize their orbits. So they go from having these elliptical orbits to these circular orbits. And the pluto charon system is trying to eject them, so or accrete them, depending on how you want. To be. <laughs> some particles get accreted and some try to get ejected. So pluto charon for the ones that want to be ejected, is pushing them out, slowly pushing them away from the system so that eventually they'll leave. And that process takes thousands, tens of thousands of years for things to be eliminated from the system. And then all these collisions happen between all the tiny little particles. Um, and so those try to make a circular orbit. So things get farther and farther away and their orbits get more and more circular. So what we do is we do a, a numerical simulation where we take the physics that we know, gravity, what happens with collisions um, and heating and all that stuff. And we ask, well, what for a system that has orbits like this, what is the, is there a final stable state where there's material orbiting 
uh, in stable orbits around Pluto and Charon. And if there is a set of stable states, what does it look like and how much mass is in it? So I won't show the whole set of calculations um, because it's a, it's a little hard to follow. Um, I'll just show you the end point. So here's one end point. So I'll show you, just discuss what we have here. This is after uh, 1230 years of evolution. We start out with uh, a half a million particles of various masses orbiting Pluto and Charon in the orbits that I had in the previous slide. At the end of 1230 years, there are 56,000 of them. So it loses 90% of its mass. Some of that is accreted by Pluto and Charon, but most of it is ejected. And you can, the center here, the white dot is Pluto, the blue dot is Charon. And then we have a ring of stuff. Every one of these is a particle. Um, and the density of particles is zero, close to Pluto and Charon, uh, in the region where orbits are unstable. And then right here at the in, sort of the inner part of where things start to turn magenta, that's the innermost stable orbit. And you can see that the particles are sort of mushy there and they haven't quite settled down. But outside of that, there's a nice ring of stuff. And then outside of that, the density of, of points just slowly declines. And I've, even though the satellites are, the known satellites of blue, the small satellites are not in the calculation, but these uh, cyan dots out here, these four dots are the current positions of the satellites. So our ring for this particular realization is a little inside where it ought to be. We have material too close to Pluto and Charon to make a satellite. And we don't have enough stuff probably farther away, but um, this just gives you an idea. We have simulations where the reverse is true, uh, where this hole, the hole in the center is bigger and the ring is bigger uh, and the satellites sit on the inner part of the ring. And so we have to fine tune some things to get the right, the right set of, of parameters uh, from this collision, since we don't know what the initial conditions are to make something that works. But we have something, we have an end point, because uh, if we took, did this for another 10,000 years, this isn't going to change. These are all nice stable orbits. Uh, everything is happy. And you know, now we have to figure out how to make the satellites out of that. Because um, these are all sort of meter sized, centimeter sized and smaller objects and they have to agglomerate and become the satellites. But we have a chance of doing that. Now we have the large impact. The large impact happens on a binary, kilo pluto Charon binary that's wider. So here's Pluto, here's Charon. You can see there's some stuff that's not quite ejected yet, but we have a much more concentrated ring um, with not a lot of particles out at the outer, outer edge. And this ring is a little too big for Pluto, for the satellites to form, because you can see again, the four satellites are on the inner part of the ring rather than the outer part of the ring. This is after a hundred years uh, and it only takes a hundred years for this to become stable as opposed to the previous one where it's a thousand years. So we have a bunch of collisions, if you will, a collisional you know, output or outcomes that lead to the production of a ring of stuff, you know, sort of equivalent to the asteroid belt orbiting the sun, you know, a ring of small stuff that orbits Pluto Charon. So we thought these were very successful calculations. We managed to take a bunch of debris that would ordinarily just leave the system. And because collisions circularize the orbits um, in a process we call collisional damping, the orbits damp and become circular. We have some stable orbits where material is nicely orbiting Pluto and Charon in a stable way. Scott, a, a, a simple so, question from, from my idle brain. What causes the dust to clump together and form these larger, you know, let, let's use the word grow, if you will, to, to go from a dust particle to something more substantial? So what happens is, so you have two particles that collide. So if you think of the, all the possible outcomes, you know, 
they, their collision could be at such high velocities that they shatter the two particles. You know, like throwing a snowball at a building. Um, you know, the snowball sort of, you know, bursts into pieces, although some of it sticks sometimes. <laughs> um, and so when you have, say, a large object and a small object, you can imagine that the small object hits it and sort of shatters, but it might leave a little bit of it behind, even if the collision velocity is high and it, the big object might not lose any matter. So that slowly grows the big object. If the velocities are smaller, you can imagine having two, two objects. And remember, these are not spheres. These are sort of fluffy uh, things. You know, two objects coming together at a very slow velocity. When they hit, if they don't shatter, you know, they try to go through one another sort of, and they might get stuck together and add the mass that way. But doesn't, you know, doesn't the physics say that somehow there has to be some, some atomic interconnection of, of the of the molecules of the two particles that actually form bonds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Well, some, some of it is just sort of, uh, I, uh, at, if they're small enough, yes. I mean, the largest particles, if they're larger than a kilometer, say, two kilometer sized objects have enough gravity to stick together. And so in between, um, you know, it's, it's like taking you know, two small snowballs. You can imagine snick, <laughs> sticking two snowballs together. They don't necessarily have to make chemical bonds, but they can sort of stick together. I mean, in, you know, for the smallest particles that are say, you know, micron size or, you know, much smaller than a millimeter, um, the calculations that people do and the experiments, I and mean, people do experiments, including on the space shuttle of, you know, Brownian motion and having things stick together. Um, there, you know, you do form some sort of chemical bond, um, but as the objects get larger and larger and larger, um, the bulk properties become more important. And, you know, sometimes, you know, astronomers have this, you know, and, and planetary scientists, you know, talk about the stickiness of solids. And some solids like silicates are not very sticky, but ices are very sticky. Um, and the more, and people have done experiments with organic grains, grain, grains composed of organic you know, molecules. Um, and those are extremely sticky. So, you know, I mean, who knows exactly what's in these, but for ice, uh, ice is very sticky from the experiments that have been done in laboratory. Uh, do we have any, do we have, it? is there any knowledge of, of what the composition might be based on uh, the asteroids belts that are nearer to the earth that we actually uh, the, have, ex the, have experimented the new, with? The New Horizons mission, um, so for Pluton Charon, they are big enough and bright enough that you can get uh, spectra of them uh, on, from HST and ground-based telescopes. And that's where it was first discovered that they have nitrogen on their surfaces. Um, and when New Horizons flew by, they did take spectra of, of everything that they, that they could. And the four small satellites are composed of ices, um, you know, water ice, nitrogen ice, but mostly water ice. Um, and that's why they're so reflective is that they're, they're very icy. Um, they're not, you know, silicate rock which does not have a high reflectivity. Um, so we have an idea of the composition based on you know, the New Horizons flyby and from ground-based observations of, of Pluto and Charon. How does this relate to the rings of Saturn? I know gravitation that, and mass is a lot more on Saturn. Is this just a slow-mo uh, version of, of what how uh, Saturn got so, its rings? So, so the the structure of these rings is very similar to the rings of Saturn in the sense that the particles are small. Um, in, the, in the rings of Saturn, the stuff is so close to Saturn that the small particles can never grow into a big thing uh, because Saturn's gravity rips them apart because they're inside what's, what's known as the Roche limit. Um, so there's a, a limit around every object, the sun, the earth, whatever. Um, 
where um, you know big objects just can't survive because the tidal forces rip them apart. Um, so in Saturn's rings, all of the ring material is inside this tidal limit. Uh, and these, in these simulations, um, the, the tidal limit, if you're inside the tidal limit, because it's a binary system, those orbits are actually unstable. So you can't actually have a Saturn's ring-like structure um, at the distance of the rings are from Saturn if Saturn were a binary, because those orbits would be unstable. But for the, the pluto charon system, these rings that I've showed you, this one and this one, are far enough away from the, the system that they're not inside this tidal limit and things could agglomerate into to bigger things. Scott, would, the, would, these, would the satellites have enough gravity to cause accretion of these particles or in these magenta rings? So the, the small, the existing small satellites of, of um, let's see, I might have a, let me move ahead. I think I kept that, did I keep that? Let's see if I kept, here we are now, that, this one. So um, this is a calculation where we took the four known satellites um, which are the four innermost dots. This is Pluto, this is Charon, this is four dots. <laughs> These are the sat four known satellites. And outside them, we put three other satellites just for fun to see what would happen. And we just sprinkled a lot of, you know, essentially dust, you know, household dust <laughs> around the system and asked what would happen. And this is what the system looks like after a million years. So after a million years, um, Hydra, which is the most massive satellites, you can see that it's, and the blue dust, as you will, is, is the dust. So outside, um, the dust is still there, but inside the planet, the satellites are clearing out their orbits of stuff. And they would either accrete it, um, in this case, we didn't let them accrete it, um, or they would eject it. They would push it out of their orbits and eventually the material either gets too close to Pluto Charon or it goes away uh, in some way. But anyway, the, the satellites are massive enough, um, given their nominal masses that we think they have, to clear out their orbits and, of, of small particles. So I'll go on to my conclusions. So what we get from we did about, I would say about 50 simulations, uh, which take, take about a week. Uh, it's a sort of, let's see, it's 112 CPU weeks on a, a supercomputer uh, for each calculation. Um, so we did about 50 for each of these configurations. So if we have a, the, the debris from the giant impact where Pluto and Karen collide and there's some debris around, all of those simulations produce an extended disk around Pluto and Charon. Uh, the large impact where the binary is in its current configuration and uh, we have some debris around it ends up producing a more narrow ring. And so the, the next step of this is to see uh, if we grow satellites in distant rings, which is a much simpler calculation uh, and we're confident that we'll produce satellites um, whether or not those satellites have the properties of the pluto charon satellites. And when, when JWST is launched, um, uh, JWST is sensitive enough that it can detect um, satellites with radii of a half a kilometer to a kilometer. So about 10 times smaller than the current satellites. So we're hopeful that um, the team that is uh, in charge of Pluto <laughs> uh, on JWST will do the right kinds of images to figure out uh, if there are or smaller satellites. So I think that, um, I hope I've convinced you that uh, there's a lot of interesting physics in the Pluto system um, and whether or not you call it a planet or a dwarf planet, uh, Pluto, the Disney character, is probably pretty happy that there's a you know there's a lot of interest in Pluto, uh, 
for its own right rather than whether it's a planet uh, or a dwarf planet. And so I'll take any other questions and thanks for your attention. I have a kind of a comment that's um, as soon as the uh, Pluto was demoted, uh, what happened was books, uh, writers of astronomy books that kids uh, see, suddenly uh, Pluto disappeared. And even though we had the New Horizons, a tremendous new information coming out uh, with photos and images, suddenly, if you look at those books that kids see, <clears throat> there is almost nothing about Pluto other than, and the, you know, the usual thing is you have eight planets, and by the way, we have some dwarf planets. So I think from an educational point of view, we really are doing a disservice because as you pointed out, Pluto has a tremendous interest in its composition, in its you know, uh, environment, and all of that information basically for kids, and I'm talking about K to 12, sort of is gone. And I, I think astronomers have done, <clears throat> have done a disservice because as soon as we got this great information, suddenly we're going to bury it and say, oh, by the way, etc. there are these uh, dwarf planets, period. So that's my commentary on why I don't think <coughs> demoting Pluto was such a great thing from an educational point of view. Well, I, I, I agree. I think that the books for... Um, whether it's for K through 12 or for undergraduates or graduate students, um, lose a lot of richness when they don't include um, a lot of interesting things that are going on in the asteroid belt um, and um, this Kuiper belt, uh, you know, including Pluto. Because um, not only is Pluto interesting, but there are um, little moons around many of the other uh, of these Kuiper belt objects. Uh, and many of the asteroids are also binaries, uh, and, sat and you know, satellite missions have visited various asteroids and you know, bring stuff back. Um, now, I think these books miss a lot of uh, possibilities to get people interested in the rest of the solar system, um, because most of the volume of the solar system is occupied by small by objects that are smaller than planets. Um, you know, the dwarf planets and asteroids and Kuiper belt objects and, you know, even beyond the, the figures that I showed you, um, there's a whole host of other objects um, well, you know, in beyond the orbit of Neptune uh, that are fascinating from either a dynamical point of view or just an astrophysical point of view or a planetary science point of view. And I think that richness gets lost in books you know, that are more elementary. It seems to me that one of the benefits that astronomy has had over some other scientists, some other sciences, is that for the last 40 years or so, there have been a number of, of people like Carl Sagan and others who've had the ability to bring an aspect of that science to people who otherwise would be totally unaware of it, and, and that includes uh, that includes kids. Now, then, of course, you got people like Bill Nye who bring virtually any form of uh, of science in front of people. And my one of my complaints with universities is that uh, they seem to poo poo the folk who take complicated subjects and make them understandable to others. And I must say that I really appreciate the talk that you just gave because it took some pretty complicated things and made it um, reasonably understandable. And that's, that's very important. Scott, I have uh, two questions if I could ask. First, um, just, the just if, I could, if I could amplify on what he said. I, sure. Another person who's done, you know, I think a tremendous job is Alan Alda. Um, because he operates a center for science communications uh, and he has a yearly challenge. And the first one 
uh, and it, it, this is, I believe in Science Magazine, I think they still do it, um, but from the American Association for the Events of the Science. And he asked people to give a hundred word, or maybe it was even a 50 word explanation of what's going on in a flame that a, a, the average person could understand. Uh, and, and you know, think about a flame. Well, that's very complicated, but he's been doing things like that. And, and um, I think he get, deserves a lot of credit for that. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, Scott, the, absolutely fascinating. And I have two questions for you. The first one, um, the Astrophysical Society uh, had a vote. Um, you could see it on, on, on television about whether Pluto would be, should be designated as a planet or uh, not a planet. Are you at liberty to tell us how you voted? I did not vote. And, <laughs> I, and I, I would not vote because I don't care. Well, the second question. It doesn't matter to me. Um, but my second question is on the, on the New Horizon mission. Did they encounter any of these uh, smaller orbiting particles? And was there any risk to the device itself? Yes. So, um, and we were actually involved in that. Um, so the New Horizons team asked various people, uh, and some did, a, you know, simulations especially for uh, the New Horizon teams, and others like us were doing our own simulations, and then they asked us. Um, but they, the trajectory th that they devised through Pluto, through the Pluto system was rather elaborate in the sense that they knew, I mean, the time that they would spend going through the Pluto system was short enough that nothing really moved. Um, so they could know where the where Pluto and Charon would be and where the four little satellites would be, but they were worried that there would be a lot of smaller things, um, you, know, my, you know, that are millimeter sized or, or smaller or larger that, you know, space telescope couldn't see, and they wanted to know where those would be. So they are, were originally planning to have their flyby sort of through the orbits of the satellites. So if you think of, you know, a bunch of concentric circles <laughs> where, the, where, the, where the orbits are, they were gonna come through the, the satellite orbits and try to get close-ups of some of the satellites. Um, we and others advised them against that because um, if something had recently hit one of the satellites, there'd be a lot of debris there and it would take a long time for it to go away. So people advised them that the, the safest place to go was through down the sort of vertically downward through the system, through a, a point midway between Pluto and Charon, because everyone said, that will be have nothing in it because you know it just can't last for very long. And if you put you know if you put a you know a silver dollar uh, in between Pluto and Charon, you know within you know a few years it would be gone. You you wouldn't be able. Whereas if you you know put a silver dollar out by the orbit of Hydra, you know it'd be there when if you came back a million years later. So <laughs> so you don't want to collide with those things. And there was a lot of discussion, and they eventually. Um, came up with it. And they, on the flyby, they actually did measure small particles. So they detected small particles as they passed through the system and before and after, but none of them were that big. Um, and so, you know, fortunately nothing hit anything major in the, in the, the satellite. So if gravity gets increased somewhat. Uh, have people been able to get anywhere close to binary stars and see what's around them? Well, well, we don't. We you know, obviously haven't gone to one yet, but we can look. And so um, there actually are binary stars that transfer matter from one star to the other. Um, and you can observe that process um, in time. So if you, you find a, one of these interacting binaries, as they're called, you just take spectrum after spectrum after spectrum, or you measure the light uh, of it from, as a function of time, and you can see the behavior, and you can figure out um, that matter is falling onto one of the stars um, or not, or falling away from another star. Um, and you can see matter being ejected from the system. So with, 
um, high resolution spectra where you can see the motions of everything, you can infer what is going on. Very interesting. And so you can it's, see that some stars gain mass with time and some lose it. Scott, for what it's worth, just to follow up on the Alan Alda thing, there's the aldacenter.org at uh, Stony Brook, which talks about his uh, educational uh, outreach programs. And I didn't go through the whole website, but it looks like it's kind of interesting. And they do uh, a full range of, uh, you know, K through whatever to uh, try to get science to young kids and, and teach them about what's going on. That so, might be an interesting discussion for a, a future uh, meeting. Yep, so hope is not lost. We will have scientists in the future. No more planets. <laughs> well, it makes it easy to study other stuff. Doc, can I ask a question that's a little bit off the, your topic? <clears throat> but I, I'm, I'm not an astronomer, so I don't have a lot of knowledge here. My question has to do with why is it that planets and satellites and so forth seem to... Um, stabilize with particular molecules as being their major features. So for example, Pluto and Charon and so forth, uh, a lot of nitrogen, a lot of water, other planets not. Well, how is it that planets um, get to this stable state of these molecules? Is, uh, what's, the, what's the current thinking about that? So, so the way that works, I, I think we understand that basic thing. We don't understand exactly why the Earth might have a little more iron than Venus, say, but we, we, we understand the basics. And so the basics go like this. Um, if you recall the image that I showed about the forming star system, where you have a star at the center and a disk around it. So the disk is hotter, closer to the star than farther away from the star. So at around the orbit of, um, you know, a little outside the orbit where the asteroids are, if you took, you know, if you took a, a if, if you could do this, if you could take a flask of liquid water um, and open it up and let it out, if you're inside this region, it will, it will just sort of evaporate and become water or steam molecules floating in space. Whereas if you put it a little outside this region, it would freeze. And that's because it's colder. So as you go, if you're, if you're a person or a thing and you go farther and farther away from the sun, you receive less and less radiation. So it's, it's colder on Mars than it is on the earth. So as you go farther and farther away, your temperature so you absorb radiation and you re-radiate it. Your temperature that sort of equilibrates how much radiation you receive from the sun and how much you radiate away, because uh, we're all radiating right now, um, gets to the equilibrium and it gets colder as we go farther away from the sun. So in the earth, you know, we're all radiating uh, because we all have a temperature of around 270 Kelvin or you know, 98 Fahrenheit or something like that. Um, and as you go, say, to the orbit of Mars, your temperature that's in equilibrium with the sun would be you know, 30 or 40 degrees cooler. And as you get out to Pluto, the equilibrium temperature is like liquid nitrogen or actually solid nitrogen temperatures. Um, you know, it's like 40 degrees Kelvin. So as you go farther and farther out in this disk, it gets colder and colder and colder. So if you think of a gas, the disk starts out as a gas, it's hydrogen, helium, and all the other elements, and all the other elements are 2% of the mass. The hydrogen and helium don't care about the temperature. They just don't care at all. Um, you know, they bounce around a little more, but that's it. But as you go from, say, the orbit of Mercury on out, um, think, you know, the, the silicate, silicon, iron, etc., will condense out of the gas uh, at temperatures less than 1,000 degrees or 800 degrees, depending on the element. 
And as you go farther and farther out, you get to a point where water can condense out of this gas, and that's at 170 degrees. And as you go farther and farther out, nitrogen will condense out, carbon monoxide will condense out, etc. So the Earth has, you know, limited amount of water because the only water it could get is whatever it could grab from the gas or was delivered by say a comet. But in Pluto, all the nitrogen ice is condensed out of the gas. And so they're in solid ice balls, maybe they're not balls, but ice ball like things that can agglomerate. So astronomers have a thing called the snow line beyond which, and it's actually a snow sphere, uh, beyond which water will condense out of the gas and inside of which water will remain in the gas. And that's true for every molecule, including so really, iron molecules. So you, you things have, have things like iron oxide or um, silicon dioxide or any of those things that make up the crust of the earth those condense out of the gas. They were originally all in the gas, pretty much all of them, um, but they condense out. So this is going, I think, somewhat back to what Peter was asking. Is there's somewhat of a chemical reaction that's going on that caused these this agglomeration at this at these uh, particular temperatures, uh, rather than a gravitational pull between molecules? Is that correct? Yes, yeah, the, the gravity of anything smaller than say, you know, 100 meters across is pretty small and, you know, is negligible from over the time scale that planets form. So you need some sort of other process uh, that will help things stick together. Won't um, Van der Waals forces uh, make it stick together? At, at, uh, for small things, yes. Mm -hmm. And there, there are electrical forces because what happens is the grains get charged. And so there are uh, I, positive ions in the gas. And because the grains um, are bigger than molecules, they attract, they accrete, you know, they run into a lot of electrons. So the grains are negatively charged and that can attract um, positively charged material um, because the electrons had to come from somewhere. So whatever, wherever the electrons are not anymore is a positive ion and that can be attracted. And then it finds some molecular way of staying on the grain. But, you know, just to, just to make the whole thing more confusing, that's, that's almost a circular argument. I mean, you know, what causes the, 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 the two atoms, you know, if you will, to combine in the first place you know, in, the, in, this, in this gas of whatever it is. Yeah, well, that, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of, there's a lot of ways of making solids. Um, and the molecular cloud, the cloud of gas that collapses to the disk has solids in it. And supernovae, for example, make solids. So when a supernova goes off, it ejects, you know, a lot of hydrogen and helium, but it checks a lot of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all that stuff. And if the um, density of the material that's ejected by the supernova reaches a certain limit um, and the temperature gets cools enough, the solids will, or the, the gas will condense. And it's like they'll freeze. So there's a lot of freezing going on. And that makes sort of crystalline solids. Um, and then the so those crystalline solids get coated with some water ice later on. And the water ice sticks together. And um, so there, there are a lot of, of, and we can see the dust form in these supernovae. Um, so you actually see this process happen. Is that um, like the Horsehead some, Nebula? Uh, no, no, that's, that's, a, that's a star forming region. Huh. Um, but there was a supernova in the, I think it was this large Magellanic called, called, cloud called 1987A. And, in, and you can see pictures of the nebula from that. But that had a period where the solids, you know, if I remember right, solids condensed out and novae do it. Red giants, red 
um, at some late in its life, you know, five billion years from now, the sun is going to expand and become what we call a red giant star. And it will start losing mass more rapidly. And when it loses that mass, uh, again, the, it, the material starts out at 3000 degrees, but as it gets farther and farther away from the sun, it cools off. And so carbon and carbon particularly, but things like silicon oxide and other silicon bearing, uh, silicon oxygen, magnesium oxygen molecules will condense out and make crystalline solids. You know, they're sort of amorphous crystals, but they do it. Um, and then those get coated with water ice later on or nitrogen ice because they get really cold. And, you know, then, you know, this, there's a sticking process associated with, with those when they collide. So you're hypothesizing that the, the basic uh, kernel, you will, of solid matter is some sort of crystalline structure, and then that other things get built on top of the crystalline structure as it aggregates and becomes something much larger over a very long period. Right, right. The, the basic building blocks are sort of one micron solids, which are, you know, either amorphous or actually really good crystal. I mean, you can see in many stars, especially old red giant stars, evidence of these solids. And you can, you see um, from spectra transitions in these solids. And, on, and along the line of sight to a lot of star forming regions, you can see absorption and emission from ices. And, you know, because ices have lots of stretching and bending modes and vibrational and rotational modes. And you can actually see the emission and the absorption from these ices. And because you see, you know, that this mode is stronger, you know, this emission or absorption line is stronger than this other one, you can learn by studying those again in the laboratory that, oh, this ice is constructed like this instead of that. Let me thank Scott. It was great to see you again. It was a fascinating talk about where we live. Thank you very much, Jerry. I really, it was great to see you, and I'm, I'm glad to uh, share with the whole group. It was really an excellent talk. Thank you very much.